All right, everybody, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons hour um, and briefing uh, streaming live on Twitch and in BlueJeans as well. And today we have a two-parter. Um, we're going to hear from Kirsten Newcomer, who is part of the OpenShift product management team and one of my favorite security people, on why DevSecOps is critical for containers and Kubernetes, coming off a great blog post, um, which you should all read on Dark Reading. I think that's what it's called, a dark, dark reading blog. We'll post the, the link to that as well. Um, and then we have uh, Keith Basil, who is going to talk about some of the things you can do to automate some of the compliance in OpenShift afterwards. So it's two-parters, and we'll have some live Q&A at the end. Um, and so hang out for with us for an hour or so, or see how long this goes. And um, first off, I'm going to let Kirsten kick it off with a a short talk on uh, why DevSecOps, did I just say that? DevSecOps <laughs> is critical for containers and Kubernetes. It definitely is. So anyway, yeah. there's my blooper for the day. Um, there so we take go. It, take it away from me, Kirsten. All right. All right. Happy to talk to everybody today. Um, so, and let's see, there we go. So as folks know, right, I'm just going to do a little bit of lead up here, but right, today's world, um, Everybody needs to work to differentiate from everyone else. And a key element of differentiation is being able to deliver whatever innovations you have been working on as fast as possible uh, to ensure that you are addressing your customers' goals and kind of uh, getting ahead of the competition. And so really, with changes in technologies that, that have been emerging for, you know, probably over five years now and have really started to become widely adopted, containers, Kubernetes, microservices, and DevOps all really help to ensure that you can deliver that innovation more quickly. So hopefully by now folks are pretty familiar with containers and how they make it easier to deliver applications faster, right? You get to package all of the system dependencies that go with your application in that container image. That means that as you move from dev to test to production, there are fewer configuration changes, if any, to be made. Um, that config is, uh, those system dependencies are all in the container image. Anytime you deploy, you're deploying from that immutable container image. So you have also a simpler, uh, lighter way to deploy your application and portability across what environment. So you can, if you choose to deploy on-prem or in public cloud, you can still use that container image wherever you're deploying. And Kubernetes makes it easier to manage those containerized applications, right? You need uh, a platform that helps you scale that provides uh, resiliency and built-in high availability for your applications. Um, and container orchestration platforms really require some additional things, uh, networking and routing, persistent data storage. All of these are capabilities that Kubernetes provides. And really, well, we saw, you know, three or four years ago, we saw a wide variety of container orchestrations out there, in, uh, orchestration tools out there in the market. Today, really, we, we see primarily Kubernetes. We know it's one. So DevOps, so, so we've talked about containers for applications, making it easier and faster to deliver. Kubernetes, making it easier to manage your containerized applications. Uh, with the declarative nature of Kubernetes ensures that if an instance of your containerized app goes down, another one is automatically spun up. But in addition, DevOps is really a necessary part uh, because agility can't succeed in silos, right? So we're talking about an environment here that involves all of these people down at the bottom of this slide, right? You've got your network admin, your security team, your developer who's building the containerized application, the line of business who's driving the innovation that your customers or your partners need to take advantage of. Um, because you may be deploying in the cloud, you've got your cloud admin as well as the sysadmin to think about. And of course, your ops team has to think about all of these elements all the way through. So DevOps is about getting things out the door to end users quickly and reliably. And DevSecOps is about doing that 
quickly and reliably and securely. And the, the reason that DevSecOps matters so much for containers and Kubernetes is because containers and Kubernetes are both an opportunity to improve security and a challenge to the traditional approaches to application and platform security. So um, this uh, content is actually based on uh, a YouTube presentation that was um, done by uh, um, <clears throat> OpenShift users, as you can see, back in 2017. But this group was particularly committed to, uh, as their chief of cyber defense put it, to improving security with containers. He really felt that this was a huge opportunity for them to change how they addressed the security of both the applications that they're deploying and the platforms they're deploying to. And they did that by genuinely adopting this, this DevSecOps model. So their chief of cyber defense, the head of the app dev team, and the head of the operations team got together, they sat down in a room, they determined what were the key use cases that they needed to meet as they were embarking on this container journey. And they came to agreement, not just on those use cases, but also on how they were going to, to meet those use cases. One of the things that was key here, um, because DevOps is not just about technology, it's also about people. So actually two things were key. One is that this group uh, at the upper level of the organization decided that this was an important opportunity and decided to work together to figure out how they were going to make this happen and empower their teams to make it happen. And one of the other big different, big, big and important changes here was that all three teams decided they needed to learn from each other. They needed to understand more about what mattered to each of the different groups, each of the different silos, what used to be silos. And in particular, the security team determined that they needed to understand more about development tools and how developers did their work. And this wound up in a, in a situation where now security has shifted left in their organization. Uh, more of the security tools are deployed in the CICD pipeline. The security team is alerted early on if there is an issue and can, as is stated here, can break builds if they wish. And really all that means is they can say, hey, this build can't go any further until you fix that particular security issue. And that's a benefit both to dev and ops, not just the security team. I mean, as a developer, who wants to hear right at the end as you're ready to deploy your application that there's a late breaking vulnerability that you didn't know about that your security team found and now you have to rebuild and redeploy and that delays your release. And ops doesn't want to deal with that either. They need to know right now we have OS libraries embedded in those containerized applications in that container image. And so sometimes the updates uh, that need to be made are being made in that OS layer, which is the traditional responsibility of the ops teams. So again, all of these teams need to collaborate together to have an effective, agile, and quick release process that also provides the security enterprises require. So let's kind of take a bit of a deeper dive. So containers do change the application security model, right? And, um, you know, this is, the, the workloads are, are becoming more short-lived, more ephemeral, right? So when you were deploying monolithic apps to a physical machine, kind of everybody knew, you know, what was the IP address of the host that the app was deployed to. Um, then when we moved to virtualization, you still had a lot of that same information. Now you have VMs to configure, not just the apps. Um, those VMs might live for months or years. Um, but you move to containers, and containers are intentionally ephemeral. They are intended to be spun up and run for as long as necessary. And then with the addition of Kubernetes to the containers environment, right, if a container instance, uh, even without Kubernetes, if a container instance dies, you would just deploy a new instance from the container image. Kubernetes just makes that easier and more automated. And so those changes mean that we need to think differently 
about our pipeline. We need to add even more automation into our application CI-CD pipeline. Um, because containerized images, again, require those, uh, those OS dependencies to be built into the container image, you're always gonna be using some external content in your containerized application. You want to assess that content as early as possible, as soon as you bring it down into your environment. That's one of the key reasons for using a private registry to manage images. You want to think about what security gates you need to put into your CI CD process. Are you willing to have certain, you know, critical vulnerabilities break the build as our, as our friends did um, mentioned earlier? How are you going to manage application secrets in a container world? Um, what do you, what's the runtime uh, security posture that you need to think about? And one of the key differences that really drives the move to a DevSecOps model for building your container images is that you should never patch a running container in place. And one of the reasons, again, is so let's say you're running your containers in Kubernetes. You've said, I want three instances of those uh, of that web front end part of my application running. One of the instances dies, and Kubernetes is going to deploy a new instance of that from a container image. If you patched that running instance, that patch is lost. So you always need to rebuild and redeploy to address any security issues or any other type of bug, of course. So that just means you need to think again about more automation. And there's some opportunities here. So you wanna look at what security tooling can you build into, um, can you integrate into your IDE environment? So for example, um, you might want to use uh, Code Ready Workspaces, which is a hosted IDE that allows you to uh, kind of gives visibility to everyone across the team about the code you're working on as you're working on it. Um, and it means that you don't need to download any code to a local laptop, right? You can ensure that the code is, is secured in one place because it is an IDE as a SaaS offering. You can use solutions like Sneak, which do um, early on in the IDE provide dependency analysis and so if there is a known issue in one of the pieces of the code that you're using, it'll let you know what some of those other dependencies are, say you need to do an update. You absolutely need to be investing in automated unit testing. Um, oftentimes for organizations who are, you know, moving existing applications to containerized apps, automated testing is one of the biggest stumbling blocks so, so sometimes when you're starting out, you want to start with a greenfield app, but unit testing is usually easier to add than some of the more complex testing that you might do down the road. But you also want to add in things like SonarCube or Coverity for code quality. Some of those code quality issues can actually be security concerns. And then you want to think about uh, security scanners like uh, Aqua Security, Claire, which is available to you with Red Hat Quay, Twistlock, now known as Prisma Cloud. Um, and you want to take advantage of things that may be available to you in a platform like OpenShift, Force to Image, which makes it easy for your developers to work with the latest image from Red Hat and image streams in combination, always making sure that you're pulling down the latest base image with those OS dependencies um, and built-in pipelines that help you automate, rebuild, and redeploy. But you absolutely want to be sure that you invest in the appropriate level of automation here in your pipeline um, and also in your production environment, in your runtime environment. And so in addition to the built-in security capabilities that come with a platform like OpenShift, there are partners out there who provide additional security capabilities uh, as need that can enhance what you've got available. You can work with part, uh, companies like Aqua, for um, Aqua and Twistlock, again, Prisma Cloud, for additional runtime security, CyberArk for secrets management, Sysdig for deeper data collection and analysis. And that's really kind of on the application side of things. So the dev side, uh, as we step into production, that is, again, more the ops side. But as we continue to think about ops, Let's take a look more about Kubernetes at Kubernetes itself, right? So 
Back in May of 2019, the CNCF released uh, open sourced a security audit that they had commissioned of Kubernetes itself. And there's a link here to one of the four pieces of collateral that was released. And, and the overall conclusion of the audit is that Kubernetes is a large system with significant complexity. And so again, um, some of that complexity comes from the declarative nature of uh, this, the system, that it has many different parts, and each of those parts has declarative config data. So it's not the fact that it's declarative, it's more that there are many different parts with many different configurations. It's a dynamic system, Things are changing regularly as new applications are deployed, new solutions added to the cluster. Um, it's automated and it is an API managed platform. And there are organizations who are not used to the level of automation that uh, Kubernetes leverages and the benefits of it. And, and to get the real benefits of that automation, you need security solutions that know how to work with a, this platform in a much more automated way. Kubernetes requires an SDN. Um, some of the traditional network security tools don't work well with SDNs, right? Um, application configs and deployments are managed in new ways, whereas a, a application deployed to a VM, again, you know, kind of that might be in place for, for months or even longer. Applications deployed on Kubernetes are gonna change as needed as something happens. You need to scale up, you tell it you need to go from three instances to five. I've now got five instances and I don't know where on my cluster those are deployed. Locations change as needed. And containers themselves are opaque to many existing security tools as, as well as in general the way uh, Kubernetes works. For example, there are a lot of, uh, you know, certificate management solutions that aren't used to working, that, that aren't used to being managed in an automated fashion. Teams might be used to asking for a certificate for their application that they're planning to deploy from the team that owns the CA, and it may take a couple of weeks to get that set of certs for their app, or they need a new VM and it may take, you know, a week to a month to get a new VM for their application. Kubernetes, once that cluster is deployed and up and running, you're in a position to just go. So again, collaboration, understanding what all the goals are of the different teams and how to ensure that those teams are met, really, that those goals are met, really requires a highly automated set of solutions to complement your Kubernetes and container deployment to ensure, so you need security automation, not just application and application platform automation. We've kind of already been saying this, right? So doing Kubernetes right for the enterprise involves a lot of different things. Um, you have to have your hosts set up, you need to validate your environment, you need to manage identity and access, um, you need to think about adding monitoring for the platform as well as for applications. There are going to be cases where you need persisted storage. You need to think about managing north-south traffic for the cluster, ingress and egress. You need to think about effective management of the SDN and the east-west traffic. You need to think about um, potentially how are you going to manage chargeback if you're running in the public cloud? How are you going to harden the platform? What certifications do you need? Disaster recovery, and how are you going to manage patching and upgrades to all of the different components that make up not just Kubernetes, not just your custom applications, but all of the additional things you add to Kubernetes to make it enterprise ready. Your logging stack, your monitoring stack, um, your security tooling that you add. So, in addition to kind of all of that, we so, so kind of as a high level way of summing that up, right, we need to think about host security, runtime security, identity and access management, RBAC, um, project namespaces. So Kubernetes has the concept of namespaces. If you choose to take advantage of those to have a, a multi-tenant cluster, you wanna be thinking about how you're gonna work with that, network isolation, all of these things that we've touched on 
um, with the addition of secrets management for the cluster itself. And so one of the ways we've tackled that with OpenShift 4 is we've taken advantage of uh, a new object type uh, available to the Kubernetes ecosystem, which is Kubernetes, Kubernetes operators. That has allowed us in OpenShift 4 to use Kubernetes to manage and secure Kubernetes, right? So we are, and, and we have delivered OpenShift 4 on RHEL Core OS, which is a containerized, opt, container optimized operating system, which is also managed with an operator, a Kubernetes operator, the machine config operator. So this allows us to deploy an opinionated Kubernetes cluster, full stack deployment from the OS all the way up through the Kubernetes layer, including uh, audit and logging, including monitoring and metrics, um, and including the CI CD tooling that developers might want to take advantage of. Of course, you know, with Kubernetes, you can use your own CI CD tooling outside of a kube cluster, or you can run that inside of a kube cluster. This also has changed how we manage patching the full stack that we deliver with OpenShift. So we are now able to provide patches to the host OS layer, the Kubernetes layer, all of the other components of OpenShift, including the SDN, the monitoring, the logging, in a rolling fashion through one interface. We test everything together, we deliver everything together, we patch things through the same interface. Um, and the operators that are used to manage each of these components in OpenShift um, apply those patches in a way that enable a rolling update across the cluster, in particular for the host OS. The machine config operator ensures that, uh, again, we're taking the approach of managing the host as an element of Kubernetes. So if there's an update at the host OS layer, uh, OpenShift will notice, it will mark a node as being ready for upgrade, it will move all of the workloads off that node and on to a node that's going to stay in service. The OS update will be applied, this host will be rebooted, put back in service, and OpenShift will move on to the next RHEL Core OS node. So we are doing zero application downtime upgrades for well-behaving apps um, on this, on this Kubernetes environment, OpenShift managed with Kubernetes operators. So DevSecOps at work. So when you think about DevSecOps for your teams, um, how can you get started if this is not something you're already doing? Well, just like the, the group that we mentioned early, that I mentioned early in this deck, you really kind of, first of all, you need to identify your key stakeholders um, and what your business objectives are. And ideally, you do this um, with executive sponsorship. That's one of the most effective, thing, effective ways to move forward. And of course, you also need technical leadership. And you need those technical leaders to be willing kind of to step outside of their silos, their boxes, and learn from each other. Um, it's great to start with a pilot project. We find that that is the most effective way. Um, and kind of define initial processes, tools, and then, you know, kind of identify your initial timeline, measure progress, but just like with any agile process, you need to be prepared to iterate and learn from what, from your mistakes. And as part of this, again, because it's not just about tools, it's also about people, you want to think about the cultural elements, right? So here are some of the key things that, that you really, your team really needs to embrace as part of a DevOps or DevSecOps culture. Um, you want to push responsibility down into the team as far as you can. Um, you want to incent people to take responsibility and incent them to experiment and not be afraid of failure, to uh, work with each other in a respectful fashion, to find uh, ways to trust each other and learn from each other and keep the communication open. Uh, one of our customers, uh, Schiphol Amsterdam, Amsterdam Airport, achieved a 50% reduction in application development time through adopting dev, a DevOps approach. Um, this, you know, kind of the bullets here are a little bit not just about their DevOps 
elements, right? They used the development pipeline in Open, OpenShift. They used source to image, but also some of the application tooling that they used as well. They run thousands of containers and mission critical workloads on OpenShift today. And we have other customer numbers that are even, even higher than this. So just kind of to sum it up, DevSecOps models model is really an extension of the DevOps model. DevOps was always intended to include security, but in many places that sort of got lost along the way. So um, as you look at any existing DevOps teams you're working with today, say, look, take a look, have they added enough security capabilities into their CI, into the CICD pipeline? How are you automating security on the operations end? Um, how are you iterating? How are you adapting as you learn uh, from the changing landscape and as you take on new types of application technologies? Um, so I'm sure, and, and uh, if folks would like, we have uh, teams out there that we would, you know, customers, or, or if you have um, an example that you would like to share with us, we would love to hear your experience in moving into DevOps and the DevSecOps journey. That's what I had for you today. Diane, back to awesome. you. Thanks, um, and I, that was that was great. Wonder, it's a wonderful introduction to the, all the concepts behind DevSecOps, as well as um, the importance of it for the Kubernetes um, and the, the whole cloud landscape, um, folks. So really thrilled to do that. I put in the chat um, a link, and I'll, I'll post it again at, in, um, on the Twitch stream as well, um, to the DevSecOps SIG, I said it right this time, um, so the other one would probably get more traction. Um, and uh, so if you're interested in this topic, please join us. We're going to start kicking off um, some regularly occurring um, conversations around DevSecOps um, with uh, Kirsten Newcomer and our co-chair uh, as well, John Willis from the Office of Global Transformation. I love that title. Um, and so please do join us there um, if you can, and when we'll send you an invite to the kickoff meetings for that. Um, that's uh, a wonderful way to be part of the conversation. As well, um, if you just simply join OpenShift Commons, we will give you, put you on the newsletter and get you um, uh, announcements of all the other SIGs and other briefings and other twitchy things that are happening too. So, um, Thank you.